Okay. So that looks okay, I guess. <clears throat> Great. Um, so yeah, I thought um, uh, I, I would just um, go through uh, the the sequence of works that led me to to building the the project that you're sitting in now. Um, there is, I think, from the very beginning of my practice, uh, I've been interested in this idea of of a kind of um, DIY architecture, self-made structures, and um, this is a, a project from 2007. Um, I had a, an exhibition at the Seattle Art Museum in Seattle, where I'm from. And I had this kind of um, very, uh, you know, an idea kind of based in in land art, or you know, in response to 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 Smithson, maybe this idea of like um, something outside the museum, like the 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 site and on site that that the work is maybe taking place somewhere else. And I had this really um, uh intense desire to create the exhibition space as a space of of longing somehow and so <laughs> uh, my brother and i and a couple others planned to build a, a structure um on afagnac island which is an island just off kodiak in alaska um and the the plan was to go there and and build something and then come back with a photograph that would be shown in the museum um and and to create a structure that would theoretically be kind of like a uh an open public space and so <clears throat> we did that we flew up there um you can see it's uh, there's snow on the ground um, getting to this island alone was um, quite a treacherous adventure, and we cut down a few trees and um, slabbed them up into boards and uh, created just a very rudimentary structure that you see there. Um, and um, It may still be there for all I know. Um, <laughs> so of course, like also this um, way of working in natural in 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 uh, a natural environment, working outdoors, working with trees, working with the lived uh, living material. Uh, became really interesting to me as a way of kind of um, working against uh, an idea of authorship, like maybe breaking down um, some of, or, or uh, releasing some control over the final form of the work. Um, and this is a project uh, for Ile de Vesuvier. It's like a, an island, again, an island <laughs> in uh, France. And um, here the, the proposal was quite straightforward to, to put a block of marble into a tree and leave it there and, and um, again, it's this kind of question of like, what's what's going to happen with this scenario? Um, does the block of marble, it's quite a, a thick slab of marble, actually, quite heavy. Um, is it going to somehow uh, damage the tree, fall out of the tree? Um, what What could happen in this situation? It wasn't really clear when I made the piece, but um now it's more than 10 years later and i've seen pictures 
Um, they're growing together quite nicely. <laughs> it seems to be a um, uh, a fine relationship in some ways, but always like a, a temporary uh, and uh, unstable situation. Um, so now for, for some of my fundamental um, inspiration and um, predecessors, I guess. Um, this is Vanya Life um, from 1971, it looks like. Um, and this is a, 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 a zine, you know, that was published um, by a kind of nomadic group of um, uh, people living in the Oregon woods, primarily. I mean, the, it, it eventually expanded. You'll see that the part of the format here is that um, there are topics of discussion and then responses. And so um, people wrote into this zine and exchanged information about um, really fundamental uh, practices of living, building shelter, um, evading detection, um, evading authorities. Um, this was a time, you know, sort of um, uh, excuse me, just one second. Sorry about that. Um, this is a time kind of, you know, uh, around the Vietnam War and, and um, the um, protest movements that attended that when the, the uh, need to disappear um, for various different like political reasons was kind of acute. And so there's some of that going on here. Um, and and then in a kind of essential way, it's like a, a manual for living this very um, extremely Spartan lifestyle. Um, and for me, it, it also, you know, I mean, like I said, it's 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 uh, collectively produced, and so in a sense, it sort of predates and pre-visages, pre-imagines pre the, um, the internet, this idea of, kind of connected um, networks of communication, but in a very um, analog way. And for me, like, uh, you know, working in sculpture, uh, you know, between sculpture and architecture, this also seemed to be a, a community of like common um, interest to the work that I wanted to do, which is, is sort of um, has to do with a different form of occupation, right? That like, that Von Ulef was was thinking about how to <clears throat> pare architecture down just to the body, really, you know, just to the bare essentials. Um, the the structures that they were building looked like the the very first project I showed, the project in Kodiak. Um, simple shelters made out of available materials and maybe a little bit of tarp, um, but really as a way of, of bodies um, creating creating our architecture. Uh, and so <clears throat> in a kind of um, analogous way, I wanted to move into the space of exhibition and inhabit that space through the process and the means of construction, 
right? To just like <clears throat> move in and and start building and, and to change a space um, through that temporary occupation, to change it through my body. And, um, and always aware of the temporary nature <laughs> of uh, a, an artistic intervention in an exhibition space. This is Kunsthal Bern um, from around the same time there and um, 2007 maybe. And um, this was a kind of program. There's, there is a, a sort of um, geometric or mathematical uh, sense to this structure that um, fills the entire exhibition space, um, passes through walls, um, and ultimately kind of pushed the, the, the building itself to um, a, a, a point of structural crisis. Um, it's a funny story. Um, building in the process of building this structure, um, at, a, at a certain point, there was some concern from the the institution, from the curator and the preparator, about the the um, load bearing capacity of the floors. And so to the right of this um, structure, you can see like, you know, there starts to be a lot of weight there on these floors. Um, and so they stopped work at a certain point um, and brought in an engineer who drilled a little tiny, tiny pilot hole into this uh, parquet floor to kind of examine and do a little bit of archeology span on what exactly these floors were made of. And uh, they found, <laughs> that um, somewhat to everyone's horror, they were made of this kind of like hollow Italian brick. Um, and so we realized that we kind of pushed the building to its its limit there. And at that point had to, to suspend uh, building on, on the rest of that section. There was a little bit more to be added. And they went into the basement storage area and um, added these uh, jacks, you know, these big kind of um, uh, supporting jacks to just make sure that the floor was going to be okay. Um, and uh, we don't see it there, but um, in fact, oh, to the to the left there, you see a little hole. In the top left, you see a hole where the the structure is passing from one room to another, and Ultimately, a lot of the weight of the structure was born through the walls. The walls were quite sturdy, these kind of, um, you know, 30 centimeter thick uh, load bearing walls. So we, we sort of suspended the structure uh, that way. This is another project of that era. And Again, a kind of a system that starts to uh, replicate and maybe kind of um, uh, tend towards a kind of um, disorder or chaos as it as it um encounters the architecture of the host institution this is the ICA in London and it passes from the gallery spaces here through the walls into the library and into the the hallways and the um other serving spaces of the building And then, you know, I, I was also sort of thinking about like how this um, <laughs> process of, of, of collapse could actually be the basis for, for building. And so I, I was making these structures like this one here, 
um, that kind of uh, relied on my own ignorance about uh, building principles um, that I would just kind of start building something and build it to the point where it collapsed on itself. This is like a, a cast concrete beam in the center there um, that's bearing onto a <laughs> uh, like a sheetrock wall. And so it was suspended from, I think you can kind of see the chain there. It's suspended from this uh, gigantic uh, um, crane above. And uh, as the construction process was finished, it's lowered um, down until it, it kind of collapses in on itself. Ah, yes. <laughs> Here's a, a familiar face. Um, this also is a, a, in a kind of um, an attempt to, to take this um, process of building as the design principle rather than than a drawing right rather than starting from a drawing to just start from the building and um maybe there's a kind of system there um as i look at it now it's a little hard to identify exactly what that um was but uh the the process of constructing this determined um kind of its extent and um Oscar that means there was no there was no sketch no drawings before you started this construction no i you know i think um i think the model uh the model came after the structure as far as i remember you know i had a space at this time i was working in paris and it was a um uh a, a squat at pont de Sev, this old ceramic factory which um i had a small space in and then outside we had an outdoor space um and we were able to build there and so um there are two two links of of these pine beams and i think um i just you know uh began with this very rough idea of a kind of um rectangular module and built it in various con different configurations intersecting uh one another and then the model afterwards uh is a way to kind of um preserve that uh uh configuration and is it is it found material um not found i mean it, it is in the sense that it's like off the shelf you know um this is something that uh yeah, I took kind of standard lengths, um, but it was a uh, new material from, you know, from the shop, from the mill. And you can see there in winter tour, it's now um, somewhat aged and um, has quite a different appearance, which I quite like. This is a project um, also with my brother, Eli. And um, this was a kind of, a, you know, a, a single module, a single platform, uh, a stage for something to happen. And you can see it's got like a, a lamp there. 
um, and a solar panel. And so, and then it's got a bench and, and inside the bench is like the whole, um, the battery system for the solar power. And the thought was just that this was something that um, activates at night and that can kind of be a, a, an open question in public space for something else to happen. Um, one feature of this structure, which I think is quite funny, uh, is there's, you see there near the bench, there's this kind of wet spot on the, the floor. And that was um, an intentionally designed, like, low spot in the structure so that it would collect water. Um, really, I guess, contrary to what you would want in in any kind of building. Um, but I thought it's it's interesting to have this like standing water as a, like a poetic element in the structure somehow um, that can reflect the light. Um, and it's maybe one of the first times that I was using water in a building. Um, there's a, a, I'm looking for the word, it's, um, you know, water is uncontainable and, um, And it introduces an element of, of kind of um, maybe what it is actually is that it 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 just dissolves the boundaries, the conventional boundaries of a work of art. That it that like water is everywhere and um and once there's water within an artwork then then it's connected to to everything outside of it or something like that um it's another building project from my apartment in paris like um at the time uh my family and i we had a you know a, a an apartment that had a little guest room or you know a little guest bedroom um and i which i took over as my studio and then i wanted to have a place where people could come and and spend the night still and so i built this bed in the center you can see it's got like three panels that lift up and there's a bed inside there um and then this kind of um very DIY couch <laughs> furniture built around it um, and uh, and a floor and it was yeah uh, a way of kind of um, thinking about furniture and architectural interior also as a kind of sculptural space to work. Um, and, you know, in all of these works, there's the, the presence of, of like bodies and, um, movement and the potential for other things to happen is really important to me. Like um, using sculpture as a platform or as a stage, or in this case, literally as a, like a catwalk. Um, this was for the, the Whitney Biennial, uh, maybe in 2011 or something. Um, 
good friend of mine, the artist Kate Hardy, um, had an idea to do a fashion show. And and Kate is a, a radical um, queer feminist performance artist doing something with clothes that's like that is fashion, but it's um, it's so much more than that. It's a kind of um, sculptural uh, performance based expression of the body in motion. And so I asked her if I could design the catwalk and um, I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I look at it now and I think, wow, it's really like the least functional catwalk um, that I could have designed really treacherous with these stairs, um, especially for the models walking in high heels. Um, and then it's got this kind of like um, elevated uh, walkway. Um, and it was activated during her performance and then reconfigured in another um, orientation in another gallery. So like, it was also something that, that had no clear definitive uh, form that was uh, transforming a, a structure in transformation. Um, For the Venice Biennial, um, I was invited uh, by Beecher Kierker to do a um, a para pavilion. This this great idea of like a of she invited several artists to do extra pavilions, you know, kind of like um, between the national pavilions to somehow um, also complicate that that format of the national pavilion. And um, so I, I conceived of this structure again, like as a kind of um, structure formed in collapse here, the one on the, um, the left is two sort of tabletop forms um, that were designed and built as vertical structures and then tipped against one another until they collapsed into a, a state of equilibrium, um, which was this kind of um, really exciting adventure in uh, improvised engineering. Um, and it, it worked. And through the corners, you can enter this space, which feels like it's, you know, kind of um, structure and suspended collapse. Um, and then next to it is, is this other structure, again, like kind of relying on a living tree as its structural support. And both of them together, you know, I mean, the, the, the structure on the tree um, really is just a, a platform, a stage. Uh, a, a place for something else to happen and and it did host several events the, the artist patty smith gave a little concert there um my friend carl humquist gave a poetry reading and on the back side of the structure i don't think i have a photo of that um ida ekblad uh, painted a mural and so thinking about this this structure as kind of a um place for other things to happen and uh, a host structure, a platform. This is a, yeah, maybe kind of like a new type of sport that I invented. <laughs> um, it's a, I really think about it as like the, the quintessential New York um, play structure. There's the basketball hoop and the handball wall. These two like um, quintessential Brooklyn sports. This is in Brooklyn Bridge Park. And here they're like brought together um, 
and intersecting uh, around a tree um, and bringing these two separate activities into into close proximity. Um, I like this idea of a kind of potential um, third sport emerging between the two uh, activities. And um, then maybe also as something that kind of like appears and disappears in public space that um, depending on one's knowledge of it uh, or one's perception of it, um, that something can can either appear as a natural element like a tree um, or a park furniture or a sculpture. And it doesn't really matter in a sense like the, those. And in fact, like all of those perceptions are, are simultaneously possible or possible like at different times, depending on our interaction with it. So um, this this is a really subtle piece. It was like at that same time as the, the basketball hoop piece. Um, it's a fountain um, with two um, small holes drilled through the trunk of the tree uh, and a water pump concealed underneath the ground. So like when you look at it, it's always raining. <laughs> It's always wet. It's got its own weather system, um, but it's it's quite subtle. It's just kind of trickling down the bark of the tree, um, and um... Oscar, I, I just have a question for these two um, images before these yeah. these trees. So you you selected these trees in in a wood, or and and then. Mm -hmm treated them to to be a part of the of the sculpture so this is a selection of trees that become sculpture yeah yeah exactly yeah they're not actually trees that were in the park the park was quite new at that time and it just opened um the brooklyn ridge park i think you know this amendment have opened in 2010 or 12 or something like that it's around that time um and so there weren't a lot of mature trees but i i found um trees elsewhere and brought them in and, and used them as sculptural elements. This is similar kind of work, um, but it actually uses a combination of existing trees um, and, and one tree that was imported it was a really interesting situation here. Um, next to a stream, you can see the, the stream kind of running behind the structure. And there's this like almost vertical wall of, um, of pine trees uh, on the hill across. So it's kind of a dark site and, um, and quite wooded. And, and I thought to make something that that is really imbricated and, and relies on that site. So I started working with the trees and built this um, structure, this concrete structure that might be kind of the the beginning of some kind of architecture, the beginning of, of a, a building or a pavilion, um, but that relies on the trees for support. Um, there are two trees that it, it connects to. Um, one to the right and, and the other, the, the, the one that's kind of in the center to the left is a, a locust tree um, that was harvested from a nearby, a site nearby um, and brought in to kind of like complete that section of the module. Um, and the funny story about that is like, it was cut down and planted in, the ground, you know, in a base of concrete that was two meters deep um, and, you know, probably three meter diameter, just this huge block of concrete um, and then set into this structure that, that supports it. 
Um, and then like six months later, it was still sprouting new leaves out of it. I just found that kind of fascinating um, that it, it had a kind of um, afterlife. Um, and, you know, simultaneous to all this, like working outside, I'm always interested in the space of exhibition as this kind of um, space of abstraction. Um, and uh, and one of the things I, I just became like really fascinated in for years was um, the, just like the the architectonics of walls, right? So like walls, um, I mean, at least in the American context, um, since like the turn of the 20th century, walls have been built you know balloon framing it's called um is is kind of like the typical way of stud building the building that you're sitting in right now is um built with a system of two by four or two by six wood or steel studs and then it's clad with like you know um in you know the exterior um materials or in the case of interior walls it's, it's clad with plasterboard and plasterboard also is this like really recent invention um from you know the 19 1915 1920s and it enables the construction of, of like rapid construction of these really smooth seamless walls um but what's inside there <laughs> like what's what's in that space inside the wall um that kind of became really fascinating to me as a, a a space of imagination space of potential this kind of like um unseen space at the center of 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 all of architecture really and um so there you know along with that I was thinking about thresholds and, and passageways and like passing through walls. What does it mean to pass through a wall? What does it mean to walk through walls, right? Um, and so in a very kind of flat-footed, mundane way, I started to build these um, doorways, thresholds, structures that um, dramatize that a little bit, that like make you feel the, the strangeness of walking through a wall. And of course, you know, as an artist, I think um, it's, we're always like making cover versions of of the things that come before us i i'm fascinated with this idea of like um of a cover version and taking works that i love and recreating them like in my own way and trying to bring something new to that this of course is the <clears throat> iconic uh scott burton chair and his is in granite um mine is in cast concrete and um just a, a nice way of like paying homage to work that is important to me and um inhabiting it and trying to um work in that space also in the space of the building, doubling. You know, this idea also of like a double, like the cover version is a way of, of using an existing element um, as a 
mirror in a way. So there's this is at the Museum Ludwig um, in Cologne, and um, there was several elements to this installation, but one of the things that I became fascinated with was this outdoor terrace and the revolving door that led to it just be, you know, behind the work here, you can see through the glass is this revolving door and um, it's an architectural element that I wanted to recreate like by hand. And so, um, took it apart uh, as a drawing, you know, created a, a architectural drawing of this element and took it apart piece by piece, kind of dissembled it, dismantled it, um, and rebuilt it as a freestanding structure, then with like an additional infrastructural support around it um, that acts as this mirror somehow that like when you walk out the original revolving door you go in a circle again and and walk again through this second door leading to nowhere <laughs> yeah, that's that's castillo corrales um that's a a, a um gallery space, exhibition space that I started with a, a few friends in Paris, in Belleville. And um, it was a space for, it started as an office space where we were working and then, and then we kind of started making exhibitions there and that took over. And it was a way of like, um, for me, uh, it was a way of, working for other artists and like executing their work with them for them um and the space was very small really tiny but constantly being rebuilt and um and used um for various different purposes it eventually kind of morphed into a bookstore um and this you can see at the beginning of of that process castillo corrales section seven books and Paraguay press um all kind of um cohabitating that space um this again is a platform a structure of some kind to to host um another activity um and also related to books or to literature to poetry this is a, a structure um at the sculpture park, I guess you could call it, um, of Stephen Hall, the architect. He has a space um, where he he um, invites artists. And um, and interestingly, he invites artists and poets. Um, so I did this structure there and invited my dear friend, Cedar Saigo, who's a poet, to come and, and read and to kind of inhabit this space. As a kind of, um, I mean, you'll see also in, in Winter Drew there, there's this other aluminum structure um maybe of a similar genealogy this this structure that um is incomplete um but has the potential maybe of as a, the space for one person going back to this idea of on your life and like what are the bare minimum conditions of architecture uh what constitutes shelter there we go um uh a structure that is the bare bones of architecture and that remains in a state of kind of incompletion that needs to be completed in our mind um Oh, I, I wonder how we're doing on time, actually. I should. Well, if you want to open for questions, maybe we should. Yeah, well, maybe this on point and then maybe opening for questions. Yeah, great. Perfect. 
Um, so this is uh, in Belfort in France, um, just across the border there from Switzerland, um, a town that was liberated uh, in November of 1944 by the commandos d'Afrique. Um, that was like a, a um, expeditionary fighting force that left Algiers and fought across Italy and France and um, it was kind of this neglected aspect of of um, the history of the war that hadn't really been memorialized properly. And um, so I was invited to this amazing program, Nouveau Commanditaires, which is like a way that citizens or citizen, groups of citizens can um, commission artists. And, and so the, the call was for a memorial to the Commandos d'Afrique um, through a, a, a community of um, uh, an Algerian community there in Belfort. And so my proposal was to kind of um, think first about like that relationship between um, Belfort, which is itself a kind of like important military um, site and the Lyon de Belfort is this kind of like um, icon there uh, of the, the fortress of Belfort. Um, and then Algier, where the this um, group started from. And so the, the, the bridge is this kind of intersection of these two sight lines, one to the Lyon de Belfort and the other, like the longer potential bridge to Algier and and just like what that um, the intersection of those two points um, what that implies and um, and of course you know using wood as a as a material from memorial is kind of atypical um, but for me it was really important as a way of like insisting that this is a living memory and that it requires care, it requires maintenance and the, the support and, and engagement and care of the community that, that commissioned it. So um, it's, it's something that um, may be temporary or may be, um, uh, you know, perpetual um, depending on kind of the the memorial function uh, that exists there. So, um, but yeah, um, let's uh, go ahead and open it for questions if there are any. Let's let's wait. Well, let's wait a second. Had jemand jemand eine Frage oder etwas was unklar war oder etwas was euch gefehlt hat? Oder etwas, wo ihr einen Bezug noch herstellen möchtet, zwischen dem, was ihr gesehen habt, hier auf dem Screen und in der Ausstellung. Oder auch einen Bezug zwischen dem, was ihr ähm, aufgeschrieben habt, als, als Eindruck, den ihr von der Ausstellung hattet, zu dem, was gesagt wurde. Oder vielleicht praktische Fragen, wie er dazu kommt, all das zu realisieren. Aber ich nehme, dass es die Inspiration war, dass es nicht für das Bild Also, dass der Anfang war mit dem ersten Bild, der da gekommen ist, auf diese Art, auf diese Punkt. So, one question is, um, uh, about the scale of the works and how it became, I mean, you create very large work and how the, the size of the work, what's the importance there? Or does it have to be so big to, to say what you want to say with it? No, and, and in fact, like, you know, this is a selection of, of maybe the larger stuff in a lot of ways. Um, I'm also interested in in the scale of furniture somehow. Um, 
And so there's really a kind of a spectrum. Although, you know, I think there's something, I mean, what I like to, to say or think is that like I work at human scale, um, which is like both like the human scale of building something that can be <clears throat> built, you know, um, uh, with, you know, human power somehow. Um, and and then like the scale of of the body and um so that does vary you know i mean um <clears throat> i think you know this is another example um of something yeah it is quite large <laughs> it's a big con cast concrete stove but there's a sense of of um intimacy in in the work that i think is kind of like maybe the most important to me more than scale um that's that these are objects that are meant to be touched and meant to be like used in some sense um that can offer something like warmth or shelter or um and then yeah and then um you know the structure that you're sitting in that's kind of a new um scale for me it's the model scale it's half scale and there's something really different that happens in that scale i think um that it's it's based on a structure that's that's twice that size and so to scale it down um i think creates something kind of accessible interesting um so how do you how do you go about choosing your materials i think you already talked about it for the monuments in Belfort. yeah yeah i think you know i mean um using the, the vocabulary of construction has always been interesting to me just to kind of use the fundamentals of steel and concrete um but lately I, you know I, I really um am much more interested in working with wood I mean there's there's definitely an environmental consequence to working with concrete that I'm a little bit less <laughs> um excited about at the moment um and and wood is like um there's a kind of you know infinite variety of of wood applications um but particularly right now what's possible with engineered wood you know you think about like i think in in winter tour actually there's um planned to be one of the largest if not the largest wooden skyscraper um planned in the next few years and this kind of um potential is really exciting to me it is a sustainable sustainable material and um uh and it, it kind of bridges the gap between sculpture and architecture in a really elegant way for me you know that it, it can go from a from a carving to a structural um element uh and and all phases phases in between, you know. Okay, if there's is there yeah, should be no, I, I think we're because we have to all right. Finish. So thank you so much, Oscar, for all these um for all these insights in your work. That was a, a great pleasure and um yeah, thank you so much and uh, speak soon. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Great to see you all there. Have a good day. <laughs>